Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is uh, David Montejano. I'm a professor of ethnic studies and history and also chair of the Center for Research on Social Change. And I am the master of ceremonies for the eighth annual Foundations for Change award ceremony named after Tomas Yamashita. And here to talk about the meaning of this prize is the son of Tomas Yamashita, Bob Yamashita. I've been told to be brief, brief, which is probably pretty difficult for an academic, uh, and a social scientist at that. Anyway, I need to say a couple things about my dad, and then also are the elements which go into the prize. Uh, two points of reference for my father. He was a fifth-year senior at Berkeley in 1941 he got, in civil engineering. He got his degree from the University of Nebraska. Okay, one of the interesting things is if you scan the 1942 yearbook, he shows up in a couple of pictures. One of it was, he's the only one, non-white per, non person in a couple of societies. One of them was the winged helmets of the golden bear. If you want to understand what that society is, that's what Google's for. The second element, and so that was who he was in his connection to Berkeley. The second element is thinking about the type of work which he did. He was in Hong Kong for about 30 years. He was a civil, civil engineer working in Hong Kong for about 30 years, beginning in the late 50s until the handover. If you think about Hong Kong, imagine all of what the Hong Kong waterfront looks like in your head. All the bright, shiny buildings. He did none of that. Okay? If you actually look at the type of work which he did, he did the work on foundations. He allowed those buildings to get built, but more significantly, the key projects which he worked on were the infrastructure which made Hong Kong, Hong Kong. Two key projects, the Cross Harbor Tunnel. Without the Cross Harbor Tunnel, you don't have Hong Kong becoming the kind of metropolis in which it is. The second major project, it's still standing, a minor bridge which connected Hong Kong's first container port to the mainland. If you look at, if you understand the engineering, incredible feats of engineering, that's the type of work he did. When we thought about this prize, and I was working with Rachel Moran, uh, former, who's now a dean at, at UCLA, I think it is, and when she was the director of the institute, was trying to figure out uh, how do you recognize, how do you begin to reconcile what he did and where he was. And, I'll reframe it in a diff slightly different way. Since uh, Troy got me stuck in rare disease, studying rare disease, and in fact, it's uh, the neglected of the neglected. At the very first conference I went to, there was somebody who actually knows David Minkus and actually still remembers David Minkus. Uh, he's at University of North Carolina, and he, I, I walked into this conference years ago, and Literally, I was the only one in many different ways. I was the only social scientist at this massive conference of uh, sickle cell disease. And Joseph Telfair looks at me and says, Yamashita, good to see you here. He says, you're a sociologist. Take a look around you. There's two kinds of people working in so here at this conference. People working on the disease and people learning and living off of the disease. Watch. See what happens. Okay, this prize is really to recognize the people doing the work on the disease or work of change. Make sense? It's very different. Think about that. There are two awards for the Yamashita Prize. Uh, the first is an honorable mention uh, to Mimi Kim. Mimi Kim was nominated by four fellows of the, uh, four graduate fellows of the Center for Research on Social Change. And here to talk about Mimi Kim is Vina Dubal, who is a UC Berkeley PhD candidate in jurisprudence and social policy. Can you hear me? Should I need to talk louder? That's good. 
So it is with a great sense of privilege that I present the 2014 Yamashita Honorable Mention Award to Mimi Kim today. Mimi is one among a cohort of six graduate fellows at the Center for Research on Social Change. Her five co-fellows, including me, collectively nominated Mimi for this award. Over the course of our two-year fellowship, training together, we were continually inspired and in awe of Mimi, her engaged research, and her path-blazing role in the anti-violence movement. Indeed, when we began our fellowship, we were all a little taken aback to realize what a true hero we had in our midst. Mimi has been a national pioneer in the field of anti-domestic violence and sexual assault. She was among the first in the country to recognize the need for culturally competent anti-violence services and to conceive of and extend such services to diverse and marginalized communities. Over the past 25 years, Mimi has founded not one, but four anti-violence organizations, all of which are providing services to poor, immigrant, LGBTQ, and racial minority communities to this day. For example, in 1988, when anti-violence services to immigrant communities were rare, Mimi conceived of and co-founded Can Win, Korean American Women in Need, a women's advocacy organization based in Chicago that helped and continues to help thousands to escape violence, find housing and legal support, and develop job skills. During her full decade of service in the Bay Area at the Asian Women's Shelter and the Korean, Amer Korean Community Center of the East Bay, Mimi founded another anti-violence organization, Shimta, which is the only Korean American anti-domestic violence and sexual assault, assault advocacy program in Northern California. While Mimi's impressive record of service and advocacy amazed us as her co-fellows, this is not why we nominated her for this award. What struck us and inspired us was this. Over the course of many years of demanding high-stress community engagement and community organizing, Mimi began to question her work and the work of the movement that she dedicated her life to. This was both a difficult and dangerous thing. Why was it, she asked herself and her colleagues, that the liberation-based feminist movement of which she was a part was contributing to and participating in the carceral practices of the state? Why were progressive advocates prioritizing criminal legal remedies to the disadvantage of community-based remedies? Observing that women, men, and gender non-conforming survivors of violence from communities of color were unwilling or unable to turn to the criminal justice system for safety, Kim not only questioned the strategies of the anti-domestic violence movement, but she also spoke truth to power. She created to what, in my, to my knowledge, is the very first prevention project and organization focused on bystander interventions. Through this organization, which she aptly called Creative Interventions, Mimi developed new models for addressing violence and created a toolkit for people intervening in violence that is now being used by advocates both nationally and internationally. Mimi will be graduating with a PhD in social work in two months' time. During her time as a graduate student here at UC Berkeley, she has worked relentlessly, relentlessly to spread the gospel of how and why the anti-violence movement needs to embrace community-based interventions and move away from the carceral remedies and strategies of the state. Her dissertation, research, and prolific publications trace the historical origins of the anti-domestic violence movement, examining why radical feminists turn to the criminal justice system for help and interrogating what other remedial possibilities existed. Through her scholarship and her decades of activism, Mimi has fundamentally shifted the possibilities of the anti-violence movement. Mimi, your advocacy and your scholarship inspire me, and they inspire our graduate fellow co cohort. You are a hero. Thank you so much, Vina. I think you have a sense of the, the wonderful um, uh, community that we have here at the Center for Research on Social Change. Um, and to be nominated by my um, fellows, 
fellow fellows um, in our cohort has really been an honor. I did want to say um, a little bit, and I hope that this doesn't extend too long, but um, I just want to tell people that um, that I, um, my father's a political refugee from North Korea, and my mother, in many ways, is a refugee from a, a violent family. Um, both are victims of the Korean War that has left our country divided to this day, um, 64 years after the break of that war. And so I think to myself that it's no wonder that I've been interested in um, the intersection between um, interpersonal or gender vi violence and um, state violence. And why um, I have been really seeking solutions to violence that do not contribute to separation and division, but rather can lead towards stronger bonds within our communities. Um, I found over time, um, as Vina had pointed out, that through my work in domestic violence, although I, I have uh, utmost respect for the courage um, and the tenacity of the movement, um, as she said, I have also been very disturbed by the increasing turn towards criminal justice uh, systems for our solutions to violence. Um, I just want to say briefly that I had, like this week has really been kind of astounding one for me, in many ways uh, represents kind of a pinnacle of my work over the past de decades and over the past few years in, in this academic setting. Um, I was, I really had the honor and privilege of going to a statewide meeting of domestic violence advocates, of, uh, almost 200, earlier this week. Um, I remember a time when we had statewide meetings that were held within the Office of Criminal Justice Planning, and we had to go to workshops uh, that included things such as uh, best practices in ramming down a door, um, uh, profiling of Colombian drug smugglers. Um, basically, we as an anti-violence movement had been so connected to criminal justice that we shared our conference space, and no wonder that we were unable to really organize our way out of um, that kind of uh, bind that we had gotten ourselves into. So I was invited to this, um, this conference earlier this week where, one, um, I got to uh, present together with Angela Davis, something that you can imagine would have been impossible when we had conferences under the uh, Office of Criminal Justice Planning. Um, not only that, which was amazing and personally, of course, amazing for me as I've been in awe of her for so many years, um, but that also we were on a platform when we talked about such things as uh, the prison industrial complex, uh, prison abolition and revolution within um, uh, a context in which I would have found that impossible even a year ago. Um, and third, that we, that the audience was so excited about thinking about new solutions to violence that turn back to communities rather than the state, that um, I really was astounded. I thought this is really a new moment in history and something that if we're talking about engaging in social change um, can really be, hopefully, uh, later can be chronicled by somebody else looking at the history of the movement and, and may mark um, uh, California as not the leader in criminalization, but rather California as a leader in alternatives to criminalization. So um, I also want to say that today marks another pinnacle in that my work in creative interventions has been something that I talked about boldly when I first came to the academic setting and was told uh, basically that I should uh, stop all activities immediately. <laughs> and um, uh, students later told me that I should just basically not talk about it, and that was their coping strategy. So to find myself in honored in a space that has truly honored the intersection between academic work and engaged practice, um, it's no wonder that I would find recognition in this space here today and to hear about, uh, you know, to hear about all the work that um, people have done that have been part of this community and to hear the origins of this institute have been truly um, amazing. I thank you very much, um, Sarah, for sharing this, this stage with me and for all of you for um, being such wonderful parts of uh, our move towards social change. Thank you.
And now for the presentation of the 2014 Yamashita Prize to Sara Ramirez. Here to introduce Sara Ramirez is sociology professor Cristina Mora. It's just so inspiring to be here and to sit up on the stage today. It's really just a, a, a really great and harm work, uh, heartwarming event. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Sara Ramirez. I first heard about Sara on a cold morning in December as I drove to work in Barrows Hall. There was an NPR program about the way that Sara, an epidemiologist by training, had discovered a gap in the food distribution and production system and had learned to solve the issue in a way that could help to feed hundreds and hundreds of farm worker families. Indeed, over the years, Sarah has rallied countless volunteers and supporters to help glean fruit trees from those in commercial fields to those in backyards. This is usually excess fruit that would go bad for a lack of picking either in people's backyards or in commercial fields. And they might go bad because they're not picked because there's just not anyone to pick them or maybe because it's the not so nice sort of dimpled uh, fruit that hangs there that's just not appropriate for our hyper consumer lifestyles here. Well, over the years, Sarah and her group of volunteers, many of them from the local high schools but also many of them from the communities, have helped to pick thousands of pounds of fruits distributing it to food pantries that feed the hungry and family and farm worker families in the Central Valley. I remember being so touched and moved by hearing this story that I had to pull over. See, my own father came to this country as an apple, grape, and almond picker in the Central Valley. And we grew up hearing stories about uh, how he and my grandfather spent many hours out in the fields struggling to get by often not having much more than their own fruit that they picked to eat. And I could not help but to feel touched and inspired by what Sarah was doing. I became even more inspired when I looked up Sarah and read about her background and her accomplishments. I mean, Ms. Ramirez comes from her own farm worker family and has spent much of her childhood working summers and evenings in the fields. After graduating from college, she headed off to Columbia and then to Stanford to learn about epidemiology and community health. She's published in some of the country's major public health journals about Latino health. She's conducted research in some of the country's most important research centers. And right now she lectures at Cal State San Luis Obispo. And you know, having such high caliber education, Sarah could have very easily taken on a comfy job maybe at UC Berkeley or maybe somewhere else she could have found herself uh, riding in the car on the way to Barrows Hall right but she decided not to she made the decision to go back to her community to take her education take what she has learned and apply it to help the people of the Central Valley by day Sarah has a full-time job as a health educator and was formerly the epidemiologist for Pixley County in the Central Valley the area around where she's from she's committed she says to helping families there learn best health practices by day she has this full-time job in the afternoon Sarah engages in volunteer work and even mentors high school students through her volunteer efforts by night, she seems to burn the candle at both ends, and she still, she still keeps up a very engaged and active publication rec record. At night, she prepares her lectures, her reports, and her Latino public health publications. In fact, uh, I hear she's brought a group of about 15 high school students out here from the Central Valley, not only to learn about UC Berkeley and the campus, but to learn about how to apply academia uh, to the efforts of social change. By all accounts, Sarah's a role model to me and to several others. I think we are a healthier people and a better academic community because of people like Sarah. So please join me in welcoming her onto stage.
So thank you everyone for that warm welcome. Um, thank you everyone who's up here for introducing the award. For Mimi, your work is incredible. And I'm humbled to be up here with you. Uh, I want to welcome all of you um, and thank you for being here today. I want to welcome the youth from Mission Oak High School that trekked up here this morning. And also welcome my friends from Stanford in community engagement and my friends from Cal Poly. I'm honored to receive this award um, and to celebrate 35 years of the training here for social change scholars. It's, uh, it was funny to be nominated and funny to be selected for this award because many have looked at me and said that I've thrown away my education to pick fruit. In fact, the NPR piece sort of had a headline like that, Stanford PhD, you know, picking fruit. <laughs> so um, being here and learning about the history of this institute, I feel like I'm in good interdisciplinary company. I have a strong interdisciplinary training. And I want to talk a little bit about what I studied and how I got here and also show you a little bit about the work that we're doing back home. So I studied um, in the simplest way and form for me to describe it is I studied invisibility in the Central Valley. How could we miss so much suffering that takes place in the Central Valley in an area that is one of the most agriculturally rich and productive regions of the state and the nation? How and why do the numbers that get represented miss the experience and the stories of the people living there? And how, my, how are policies being created that also reflect these incomplete numbers? I spent years in the archives as I mentioned, I have an interdisciplinary background, and so I bring together history, anthropology, and epidemiology. I spent years in the archives um, and in the community. And in the archives, I was reading about the processes and the structures about the Central Valley, about policy, and it was one of the most depressing moments when I think about it. I was reading documents that were 50 years old and that describes my home region. And if you had told me that those documents had been written five days prior to my visit, I would have believed you. We talk about social change, but when we're talking about a region that experiences chronic forms of powerlessness, chronic forms of poverty and inequity, it feels sometimes like there is no change happening. It, it only confirmed what I felt I had lived with and what I had witnessed. So let me take you back a little bit about my motivations and my confrontations with disparities. Um, so Troy Duster mentioned diabetes this morning. I want to introduce you to some of my family members. So the picture on the left, my grandfather and his friend, Picture in the middle, um, paternal grandfather, maternal grandmother in the center, and on the right-hand side is a picture of my paternal grandmother and my aunt. So my grandparents came to the U.S. My grandfather came as a bracero worker. Uh, my grandmother, she came to the U.S. working um, in the fields as well. And my grandfather, he died at a young, my, well, my dad was still a child. I never had a chance to meet him. And we probably all have stories like this of the mysterious diseases that our family members die of. So my grandfather died of a mysterious disease as my maternal grandmother. I was the last grandchild she saw. They had both 
been immigrating or migrating within the U.S., immigrating to the United States, returning back to Mexico. They had worked in the fields here, and I never had a chance to meet them. On the right-hand side, like as I mentioned, my paternal grandmother and my aunt, and they both died due to complications to diabetes. My grandmother, in fact, was losing her sight when I was a child. And many of you have probably had this experience where I was the translator for the family. I would go into the clinic and translate for my grandmother when she was being seen by the doctor. My grandmother swore up and down that the reason she was losing her sight was because she had been in the fields when the fields were being sprayed with chemicals and pesticides. Now, you know, I don't know if that's really the cause of her blindness, but I do know my grandmother was also diabetic, as was my aunt, who's sitting next to her. My aunt is actually younger than my father, and she died at a very young age. But I think one of the people that got the most of my attention in sort of in my formative years was my dad's twin brother, who was diabetic. And he died two weeks after his 40th birthday. By the time he had died, he'd been undergoing dialysis. He'd completely lost his sight. He'd had one leg amputated and he was in the hospital. They were going to amputate the other leg. And he said to my dad, I feel like I'm being taken apart piece by piece. I can't keep going. All of my family members worked in the fields, as did other family members and other neighbors. And these are all experiences of my childhood. And also shaped what I was thinking about and how I looked at disparities. Um, which is quite different from when I see when I go visit my family in Mexico. As you see, you see here, there are actually gray-haired people in my family. <laughs> I only get to see them when I go to Mexico. The family members that came here to the U.S. and that worked in the fields literally died in the fields. And so I asked myself these questions about disparities, about migration and labor and health outcomes. Um, so, of course, like many young people, I wanted to leave my region. I wanted to escape. I wanted at the time to become a doctor because I thought that what I was seeing were the, was the lack of health care and the lack of access to care. And so I've you know, started at UC Davis, ended up at Arizona State. When I began my PhD work at Stanford, I took a detour to study epidemiology because I thought, wow, I'm talking about health and public health and I was realizing that the problems were much bigger than just access to health care and I didn't quite understand it, didn't have the tools. I didn't have the mentorship and the guidance that it sounds it's like some of you had here. I'm so fortunate to have had that. So I took a detour to study epidemiology and during my various locations I also was really good in obs of, at observing and documenting. This is actually a news clip that one of my professors passed to me when I was at Columbia talking about um, the obesity paradox in the Central Valley. And she asked me, she says, aren't you from this region? And she was talking about, um, you know, there's some news about Tulare County going on right now. And so I'm in New York and this is what gets passed to me articles that were talking about the obesity paradox among low-income families, among farm worker families, about schools that were having to now adapt to children going blind due to diabetes, early onset diabetes. And I felt like I was connecting these dots. And I didn't know where these dots were, were going to take me. I was also in environments where I was told there's a difference between the scholar the academic and the practitioner. And, you know, you have to choose your path. Which one do you want? 
the scholar is the one that's going to be remain neutral and to study and observe the problem. And the practitioner is the one doing it. But they're not the ones that are going to necessarily get published or get funded. In fact, I've been told that so many times. I can't tell you how many times I've heard no one cares about the Central Valley. If you do a study there, it's too small to be written about. You'll never get funded. So I also, like I said, was working in my health department. And I was studying also conditions here. So this is looking at Tulare County. And it's looking at death and premature death and life expectancy by location. And one of the things that I was finding was that we had parts in our county where you could see a 15-year difference in life expectancy from one part of the county to the other part of the county. And I took these data to the community and I said, you live here, you tell me why this is happening. But we looked at things like the structural features, the poverty, the rates of poverty, families living in poverty, the education, and and I also talked to community members to try to get a sense of what was going on. In some of these work environments, in local government, I was told that I couldn't say certain things or I couldn't engage certain board members without first asking for permission. So talk about encountering these structures of power that are invisible. So my husband and I because you realize I could not do this alone. Um, we decided that maybe we needed to create a space in our community, a space for gathering. So we often talk about social movements and you know, there's a gathering place, a community center, whether it's an urban center, wherever it might be. We don't have anything like that in my community, in my hometown. So we thought, could we create a space like that? Could we create a space where we could think about changing, you know, to create social change? Is it, can we change the social environment? Can we energize networks? Can we create new networks? Can we create a space where people feel that they are worthy of love and belonging? And even as I show you these photos of some of our conversations and some of our early work, I'll tell you that we, confront, we had conversations with people who told us many times that they felt like they didn't belong, that they weren't welcome, that they weren't wanted, that they didn't have money or resources to speak out on their behalf. And like I said, I also looked at the data and tried to put all of this together. Might the data reflect what is happening in everyday experiences that people are sharing. Their powers, powerlessness, their voicelessness, even what I might consider a lack of hope. Because I can see that lack of hope in young people and I can see it in the elders, particularly when they've encountered so much adversity. So this is what we started to do. So I want you to think about this Central Valley. Let me show you some of the photos where we began. We think about things as being cooperative and participatory. These are the children's designs. I love one of my favorite one is um, one of the children who asked us that we put a penguin house in our garden. So at some point I think we're gonna have to have a mural of a penguin house because it'd be hard to keep a penguin house in the desert practically. <laughs> So the Central Valley, I'm going to say, is a place where we need social change, where it's needed, and where it must happen. I've worked in local government and nonprofits. I feel like I've been the ethnographer in all these environments. And I can tell you that there are power structures that need to be studied and need to be changed. We dream together in community. We dream about creating areas that are healthier for living, improving our quality of life, spaces that support the mission of creating this social environment, maybe having sitting areas, places to share our meals together, to display art. What could this area look like? 
we talk about areas to live and work. I want to revive the idea of the university without walls, right? Creating outdoor classrooms, educating the members of our community who don't necessarily have the resources or the legal documentation status to go somewhere else. So we talk about what we could learn together, how we could work together, create some of our own local economies, and what might that look like for us. We also dream of areas to play. Maybe instead of dirt fields and chalk on, co on concrete, we might be able to have spaces that look more like this. And in fact, some of the young people in their drawings have asked, can we have a basketball court here in the garden? Or can we have an art space, an art studio? And we continue to build. These are pictures recently of our outdoor oven. We have fun. We actually say this is the poor, poor people's uh, spa treatment, mud and spa treatment. <laughs> and I want, of course, I couldn't talk about any of this work without Harvesting Hope, who's here today. I want to applaud. I want you to join me in applauding them. They're an incredible group of young people, and some of them live in my hometown. And when I first met them, I introduced them to a part of Otto René Castillo's poem, Apolitical Intellectuals. And I talked to them about how they are organic intellectuals. Because no one knows more about the experience, the everyday life experience of being in the Central Valley than them. And it's their voices that we need to highlight and give credit and their knowledge and their experiences that we should be validating. So the Central Valley, like I said, is a place of challenge. We do this work and we love it. We meet new people. We have fun. These are the students actually, some of the work that they've been doing, represented in the local paper. They're appearing before local boards of supervisors, the school board. This season, we have almost gleaned 25,000 pounds. And we're also building compassion and awareness. So my invitation to all of you, because we are counting on you, is the Central Valley is a place where, where there's a lot of need for change, for social change in particular. There's changing demographics happening everywhere, but in particular in the Central Valley, in the county where we're from, age and ethnicity is changing drastically. I was unsuccessful in some ways. You might look at me as being successful in, in some ways, I see myself as being unsuccessful in other ways. Part of my goal and my desire had been to encourage other people to join us to bring attention to the Central Valley. I feel that I wasn't successful in that. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about ways that you can help me and help us study and create the social change that's taking place in the Valley or that needs to be done. And I want to ask you to make one of the most invisible places, one of the most valuable places that experiences chronic poverty and chronic forms of structural inequalities, I want you to help me make them visible because our experience is worthy of being counted and being seen. Thank you. Wow, I'm glad I'm just bringing this to a close. I don't know how to follow this. Uh, I want to thank the nominating committee, the selection committee, Bob Yamashita, Don Tamaki, Jerry Takahashi, Troy Duster, 
Roxanne Altholz and Margaret Yee. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Thank you. And thank the nominators. Thank you. This brings the award ceremony to a close.